My name is Lily Pieper. I'm the senior class president, uh, a neuroscience major, and um, a member of the cross country team. It's my privilege to formally introduce uh, the 20th president of Hamilton College, President Whitman. Well, thank you, Lily. I'm delighted we're able to do this conversation tonight, and thank you for taking the time. Thank you for coming. Um, we encourage all of our viewers to post questions in the Facebook uh, comments section of this video. However, we do have a lot of questions that were answered previ asked previously, so we'll try to get them all in. Um, our first question for tonight is on the topic of diversity of thought. You've talked often about the need for students to be open to different ideas and points of view. Earlier this year, Hamilton announced a new program aimed at modeling this objective. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure, I'm happy to talk about this. This has been sort of a theme for me since I arrived here. It's partly a reflection of what's happening in the broader society. As you know, and as we've seen uh, all too often recently, there's been a lot of polarization um, and not a lot of actual conversation across political boundaries. And we thought it important for our students to be exposed to a broad range of ideas and a broad range of views. I think that's central to a liberal arts education. And we also wanted to model the kind of respectful dialogue across political boundaries that we think is important for our students to engage in and also for the broader society. And so with the support of some very generous donors, we are launching a new speaker series. We're calling it Common Ground. And the idea is to bring respected uh, and well-known individuals with different political perspectives on campus and on some occasions off campus for a moderated dialogue and really for just an exchange of viewpoints uh, and an opportunity for our students and our faculty and our community at large to engage with those viewpoints mm -hmm. and to learn from them. Yeah, well I know that um, a lot of the students on campus are really excited for that and I'm really looking forward to attending um, the first event next month. Well that, that looks like an <laughs> opening for me to make a plug so I hope, I hope everybody who's <laughs> able it. to <laughs> comes. Our first program will be October 18th and we have David Axelrod and Carl Rove, two leading political strategists they're going to be talking about a wide range of issues with our moderator. That's Susan Page, who's the Washington Bureau Chief of USA Today. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're not, we're not suggesting that um, every viewpoint is equally valid, uh, but not by any means. But we are suggesting that there are a wide range of issues on which reasonable people can disagree. Of course. And they ought to hear each other, and, th and they ought to weigh the evidence and evaluate the arguments and reach a reasoned conclusion. Great. Well, we have another question from Joseph Androlia, who's a parent of a current student. Mm -hmm. He says, certainly college rankings do not tell the whole story. Nevertheless, they matter whether we like them or not. This year, Hamilton has dropped from number 12 to number 18 in the 2018 US News and World Report rankings. Will there be any analysis by Hamilton to understand and address the reason for this drop? Well, Joseph, I appreciate the question. Um, as you probably know, anyone who follows rankings would say two things. One, they're really not a good indicator of academic quality. And for that reason, we and uh, a large group of other colleges don't emphasize these rankings in our admission materials or elsewhere. But two, they do influence people's views and behavior, and so we can't ignore them entirely. So let me just give you a little bit of context. We are, we are looking uh, at this. Last year, we were in a seven-way tie for 12. And we had an aggregate score of 86. Our score remained the same this year. Some other schools shifted somewhat, and so now I think there's a six-way tie for 12. And we shifted one place out of that six-way or seven-way tie to 18th. The changes are pretty minimal, um, and there's a large range of factors, many of which, probably most of which, uh, relate to data that is one, two, and in some cases three years old. Mm -hmm. We think there have been some improvements on those data points for us. We are looking uh, at this to see whether there's anything that we can do in terms of how we report the data that would be both ethical and, but would also present the college in the most favorable light. But at the end of the day, we really don't want to focus too much on this ranking or any of the many other rankings that are out there. Mm -hmm. We want to concentrate on providing the best educational experience possible for our students and look for the ways that we can most meaningfully uh, make progress on that. Right. Um, another important topic right now um, is sexual assault on college campuses. A question from Connor O'Shea, class of 18, says, given that Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos recently promised to revamp the Obama-era Dear Col Colleague letter regarding Title IX and sexual misconduct on college campuses, what will you do personally, and the college more generally, do going forward to ensure that fairness and due process remain robust for students accused of sexual misconduct? 
So Connor, it's an excellent question. I appreciate the question. Um, as you probably know, this has been an evolving process for many years. When the Obama administration put out its guidance in, I think it was 2011, we and other colleges responded. Um, we're also subject to New York state law, which is one of the more stringent laws in the country on this. And we've made every effort to make sure that we have the best uh, and fairest process possible in place and that we do everything we can to protect all of our students. Mm -hmm. Last year I set up a working group specifically to review our policies and practices. It's something that we have to continuously review. And the working group concluded that in general our policies were strong and they were um, good. They had a few suggestions. Uh, one in particular uh, I think was significant and that was to create a new position for an education and outreach coordinator. So we've done that and we've made a number of other changes suggested by the working group. We're going to follow closely uh, the process that Secretary DeVos has indicated she's going to pursue in Washington. They're going to go through a notice and comment process, mm -hmm. which is the usual process that precedes the issuance of federal regulations. So we're going to watch that carefully, and we may be forced to make adjustments. But our overall goal really is to provide the best environment possible for all our students and to protect their interests as best we can. So I will be continuing to work with our Title IX coordinator, with our Dean of Students, uh, and with other offices and individuals on campus. But I want to emphasize this is also a cultural question and it's something that every member of our community, including our students, mm -hmm. and in some ways most notably our students, can help us. Uh, we need to have the right culture on this campus and around the country so that there are no incidents of sexual assault. Right, and I know there are a lot of um, rising student groups on campus which are looking at that so we have a number of student groups save smart and there may be others that mm -hmm. have been very much engaged uh, on this topic and we appreciate their efforts we're in dialogue with those groups uh, as we are with many others mm -hmm. and you know we're this is an issue that all of us need to work together on yes i think we can all agree on that um, another question comes from um, bob gabriel who is a parent of three hamilton students he asked about a timeline for building the indoor turf practice facility. Can you talk a little bit more about sure. that? Sure, Bob, I'm happy to talk about that. It was good to see you in the Adirondacks, by the way. So um, you might know that we, a uh, year or so ago, our trustees approved the construction of an indoor practice facility. Uh, initially, we were contemplating a facility without a hard top. It, was, it had a soft top, was sometimes referred to colloquially as the bubble. But as you probably know, there were some big snowstorms uh, in this area and some other bubbles in the area didn't fare terribly well. So we're reconsidering that. And th we're moving in the direction of a hardtop facility. It's still in the planning process uh, and subject to final approval by our trustees and it's going through a budgetary review. But it could be um, under construction fairly soon if everything goes well. Uh, it would take at least a year and probably more to complete it, assuming all the approvals go through. It won't be quite as large as our current <laughs> practice facility. It'll probably be about half the size of our current indoor facility. Um, I just want to remind our viewers that uh, this is a question and answer with President Whitman, and we still encourage you to um, post questions in the comment field. Um, we have another question from um, class of 2018, senior Ryan Bloom. She says the strategic planning process was advertised as something that would take students' views into account. All of the students selected to serve on committees, including Ryan, accepted and understood that being part of the process would involve work over the summer. So her question is, why were these students kept out of the working groups this summer? Similarly, why, are there, have, why have there been no surveys sent to the student body to solicit feedback on the ideas that were formalized over the summer? So Ryan, as you know from participating in this process, we did have three committees and a steering committee which we formed last year and they did their work during the academic year and we solicited uh, from a very broad range of constituencies on campus, really heard countless ideas. We ended up with pages and pages of ideas provided by students, by faculty, by staff and by alumni and the working, those groups tried to narrow those ideas down. We took uh, several sets of ideas this summer and we asked working groups to form to flesh them out a little bit and to try and put them into a more concrete form that we could then share with the full community. Students of course for the most part aren't here during the summer mm -hmm. um, and so there were not students on the working groups but we will be taking the recommendations and the ideas that have come out of the working groups and presenting them to the full community including students uh, this fall. At this point the work is really being done by the steering committee which does mm -hmm. have 
a student representative on it, the uh, president of the student assembly. So we're, we're definitely eager to get student views and we'll find various fora in which to um, obtain student views. I don't know if we're going to do surveys or we'll do focus groups and uh, maybe we'll be talking with student assembly. There'll be a variety of ways in which we will solicit uh, student input. Right. I know student assembly is always available to help and out. We are, we have, we have, and we have a student assembly Great. member on there, so <laughs> yeah. we'll definitely get student assembly's views. Perfect. Okay. From alumna Susan singer Bozier, she explains, as I look now at colleges with my children, cost is a big issue. Mm -hmm. My kids are great students and gravitate to schools like Hamilton and other NESCACs. However, now that Hamilton no longer offers merit awards and we do not likely qualify for need-based financial awards, I'm sad to think we may have to saddle ourselves and our kids with years of debt to have the same phenomenal experience that I had at Hamilton. Please discuss options for alums like myself with more than one child who do not qualify for aid, but also do not make more than half a million dollars a year. Well, Susan, I completely understand uh, and sympathize with the concern that you've raised. It wasn't so long ago that as a parent I was paying college tuition, and I'm absolutely aware of uh, the burden that can place on a family. We're very cognizant of that. We do everything we can to keep the cost down, but we're always caught between two competing imperatives. And one of those imperatives is to constantly improve the quality of the education that we provide. You know, we really think we provide the gold standard here, but we're constantly working to improve it. And as you'll see from the strategic planning process, all the ideas that come forward, virtually all, mm -hmm. will require resources. And at the same time, we're seeing change in the demographics of our student body, so our student body needs more and more financial aid. Mm -hmm. So we're very aware of, of the pressure both to keep the costs reasonable for families, but also to continue to improve the quality of the education we offer. We do have a very generous financial aid package. Uh, some years ago, the college made the decision to go fully need blind. Mm -hmm. So we are committed and will in the future continue to meet the full demonstrated financial need of any student we admit. Um, at the same time, we understand that there are parents who are a little higher on the economic spectrum, but who aren't making half a million dollars a year, and they may also need financial assistance. And we do actually provide financial assistance to a broad range of families. Mm -hmm. So something like 60% of families making $200,000 a year, their students are eligible for financial aid and are receiving pretty significant financial aid packages. Right. And almost 20% of those students coming from families making $300,000 a year are also wow. eligible for and receiving financial aid. So it may be that um, your student or others are eligible even if you might think they wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage you to speak to our admissions office and talk to them about the opportunities for support because we do recognize that the comprehensive fee that we charge and that our peers charge is a very significant amount of money. Right. So our next question is on the issue of um, free speech on college campuses. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric von Bron Brockdorf, class of 1955, asks about the Alexander Hamilton Institute and reports that copies of its publication, The Inquiry, tended to disappear mysteriously upon delivery to the Hill. Has the Inquiry delivery problem, if there was or still is one, been addressed? So Eric, as far as I know, there hasn't been uh, an incident recently involving inquiry, and in fact, as I entered the library tonight, I noticed <laughs> right on the shelf there is a big stack of inquiry publications right next to the Dual Observer mm -hmm. and some others. So I haven't heard any recent reports that there have been a problem with this. When I started, I had heard that, that, it's, that there were sometimes occasions on which copies of inquiry would disappear. If that were to happen, it would clearly be in violation of college policy. Right. You know, we're absolutely committed to providing an environment in which property is respected and free speech rights are respected, and the two of those come together uh, in the circumstance that you're suggesting. So I know that it has been investigated in the past. Uh, campus safety has looked into it. Mm -hmm. um, we do not accept that uh, as, ex you know, as uh, appropriate for anyone to try and suppress any kind of publication here on campus. Another submitted question is from Robin Gain McCullough, class of 2007. She asks, how do you connect Hamilton's unique history, like the claims of Alexander Hamilton being black, and Hamilton College, College's predecessor's intention of being an institution of learning for Native Americans to its commitment to diversity? I'm just going to add in, I'm especially fond of this question, um, as <laughs> I'm involved in the Shandara Kirkland Initiative, which you know about um, seeking to rebuild the relationship with the United American 
um, Indians and educate our campus on the history of the founding. So yeah. very interested to see what you have to say. Yeah. So, it, so it's, um, it's a great question. And I know, Lily, that you've been involved yeah. in an effort to reconnect with our historical mm -hmm. roots. We're really very proud of the history of the college. As you know, this is our 206th year. Yes. Uh, and so we're, um, we go back quite a ways. And we're you know, proud of our association with Alexander Hamilton, mm -hmm. who had such a transformative impact on this country. And we're proud of our association with the Oneida Nation. Uh, the Kirkland Academy was originally founded as an institution that would educate the children, both of settlers in the area and Oneida, um, uh, Oneida Indians in the area. And even though it didn't fully live up to that promise, um, we are cognizant of that history. And we're committed to being as diverse an institution and to support as many different backgrounds and identities and, and views as we can. Your own effort, and I know you and other students have been working on this mm -hmm. to connect with uh, your counterparts in the Oneida Nation has been very impressive, and that Thank ties you. very <laughs> nicely to our historical roots. So we're proud of the progress that we've made. You know, this year, 30% of the entering students in the fall class were students of color. Another six or seven percent are international students. So we're constantly, you know, constantly thinking about that history of an institution that brings together people from different cultures and different backgrounds. And we do want to honor that history. Of course. We have another question from senior Marquise Palmer. Mm -hmm. um, this is a two-part question. Uh, in your view, should student assembly play an active role in promoting the, idea, the ideals of the college? Why or why not? If so, to what extent? And finally, can you comment on where student assembly is relative to where we ought to be in fulfilling that role? I think that might be a three-part question, <laughs> yeah. but, I, but I may have lost count somewhere along the way. One of the gratifying things about this being my second year is I recognize a lot of the names uh, yeah. from people who are asking these questions. So I, so I do appreciate uh, the question. Absolutely, we would like students and student assembly to be involved in promoting the ideals of the college. Um, as you will know, if you've looked at our past strategic plan, we put a lot of emphasis on a self-governing community. Mm -hmm. And we want students to be very much part of that self-governing community. And I think student assembly does a terrific job of that. We want all members of the Hamilton community to contribute to promoting the ideals of the college. And I've seen the work of, of Student Assembly over the last year and a quarter or so, and I know that they've been engaged on some of the important issues that we're looking at as a college, whether it's environmental sustainability or sexual misconduct mm -hmm. or strategic planning. Student Assembly has had an important role, and I hope they will continue to fulfill that role. The extent to which any group, whether it's Student Assembly or the administration or the faculty or you know, any group on campus, contributes in any, any moment to the ideals of the college will vary over time. Right. But I think Student Assembly is doing a pretty good job, and I hope people on the campus, I hope the students will think seriously about participating in the work of the Assembly. Yeah, of course I agree with that. Yeah, and absolutely. <laughs> but I, I'd be worried if you said, <laughs> if you said no. Uh, I also just want to thank, ev thank everyone who's joining in. Um, another reminder that this is a question and answer session with President Whitman, and um, if you want to ask any questions, feel free to type them in in the comment section on this video. So the next question we have uh, is from Sue Johnson, a parent. She asks, why does Hamilton have a family weekend the weekend after fall break? It would be better to spread these events further apart, particularly when parents have to drive long distances to and from Hamilton about three times during a period of one and a half weeks. So I completely uh, understand and sympathize with that concern. I asked essentially the same <laughs> question uh, because I was uncertain why do, we, why do we schedule it as we do. And it turns out there are some good reasons not, uh, not really under our control, or at least only partially so. So we don't want to schedule it too early in the year. Mm -hmm. We want the student body, particularly the freshmen, to have an opportunity to gel as a community. Right. Uh, we want you know, performing arts groups, and groups doing concerts, for example, an opportunity to come together and to practice and, and to get ready. Um, we don't want to do it too late in the season mm -hmm. because we are in upstate New York and as you push into the late part of the semester we run into the risk of weather problems. Yes, um, of course. We also would like it to be a weekend which is not too close uh, to the fall break but we want it to be a weekend in which there'll be a lot of home games if possible mm -hmm. and we have to work with our NESCAC colleagues all of which want to have as many home games as they can so this is, is a weekend where there happen to be a lot of home games and parents generally appreciate that. Uh, we also have to work around religious holidays. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of factors that come together and when you 
you look at that entire mix of factors, it turns out that the weekend it's scheduled was the best weekend. Right. Even though we recognize it will mean a lot of back and forth for parents. So we have another question um, from Alex Frazier, class of 1985. So on September 5th, you signed a letter along with other presidents of the New York Six Consortium relating to DACA. The letter was timely, although it contained very little actual content. Would you please provide some additional information about Hamilton's relationship with DACA recipients since inception? And to the extent that there are DACA recipients on the Hill, is the college providing on-campus support for any necessary renewals? So as, as most people probably know, since it's been the subject of a lot of news coverage lately, the DACA program, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, is a program that was established under the Obama administration in order to provide certain protections to individuals who were brought here before the age of 16, brought to this country before the age of 16, so that they could attend college or find work and be productive members of the community. And since the inception of the program, Hamilton College has admitted students who are DACA eligible. Mm -hmm. And we will continue to do so. I've said that in a letter to the campus community. We don't comment specifically on you know, how many DACA students we have at any given time. We just generally don't comment on the immigration status of our students. It's right. one of our commitments to them is that we don't share information about anyone's immigration status. But we are committed to continuing to admit students who are DACA eligible. Mm -hmm and to providing them and to providing all students in our community as much support as we can. So there's a, a web page that the college has set up for students who have concerns around immigration and related issues, and it details the kinds of support that the college will provide, right. including where appropriate, uh, identifying legal assistance to those who need it. So we're fairly confident that we are doing what we can to assist students who need it, and you know, we're committed to continuing to do so. Mm -hmm. I'm cautiously optimistic that Congress will work out something legislatively that will be a fix to this issue. And it, I joined the other New York Six presidents in writing letters to our congressional delegation here in New York, encouraging them to support a quick legislative solution. Great. So we have another um, submitted question by Ward Halvers Halverson, class of 92. Um, a number of us alums throughout the country and world are especially interested in helping Hamilton students and graduates find success beyond the Hill. What programs are in place for that now, and what initiatives do you envision in the near future? Well, I appreciate the question and offer the, also the offer of help. So we would love that. We are very happy to engage with alumni in assisting our students, and there are lots of different ways to do that. So there are students who are looking for internships, um, whether during the summer, or, or after they graduate. Students, of course, who are looking for career assistance. Um, we have a terrific career center, and I would encourage you and others interested to get in touch with them about ways that you can help our students once they leave College Hill. Mm -hmm. We have students who are on study abroad programs, students who are on off-campus study, whether it's in New York or Washington or elsewhere, and there may be opportunities to assist those students as well. So there are a lot of ways for alumni to help our students. We are doing as part of our strategic planning, a pretty careful analysis of opportunities for our students off campus, both while they're students and afterwards, particularly opportunities that constitute experiential learning. Mm -hmm. So I'd say stay tuned as, as that strategic plan emerges. I'm sure there will be other ways that you and your fellow alumni can assist us, and we would much appreciate it. Yeah, great. And I can attest to um, how helpful the Career Center is. And as a senior who is looking for jobs uh, in the near future, um, it's great to hear of the alumni interest in helping people be on the Hill. Absolutely. So, so Ward, <laughs> here, here's, here's one connection you can make right away. Yeah, reach out. Reach out. <laughs> um, you can email her separately. <laughs> um, we have a question from Patty Unfred, who is a parent of a current student. She's wondering, how are you providing meaningful dialogues about race and systematic oppression and preparing a predominantly white student body to be anti-racist anti leaders in society? So I would like to say that um, it's part of our mission to have students learn to embrace difference. And one of our learning objectives is for students to become engaged and active citizens. And this applies to the entire student body, not just any one segment or component of the student body. And learning to um, understand issues around race is incredibly important. We're approaching that in a lot of different ways, and I think it's a community responsibility. It's not the responsibility of any 
single individual or any single office. It's mm -hmm. something all of us have to work on and have to be engaged with. That said, there are specific offices that focus on this in particular. Uh, in 2011, we set up the Days Masolo Center, mm -hmm. and it has been a focal point for a lot of the kind of programming that you're asking about in your question. But there's Levitt Center programming, individual faculty will discuss these issues in their classes. Um, a year or two ago, the faculty as a whole made the decision that we should add as a requirement in each concentration at least one course that deals with issues of structural and institutional hierarchies mm -hmm. uh, or more colloquially with diversity questions. And this is a fairly unique and innovative way of approaching it. So every student as part of their concentration will have to take at least one course that deals with these questions. So there's really a wide range um, of approaches to this across the campus and I think that's the appropriate thing. We can't have a some, it can't be a single office that deals with this. It's really got to be a collective effort. Right. Um, I believe that was our uh, last question, but if you can ask, or uh, if you have anything else to say before we sign off, um, feel free to. Well, I'm, I'm shocked that there are no more questions. This feels like one of my classes at the end. I ask, are there any questions? <laughs> I just want to thank all of you for taking the time to join us this evening. I want to thank Lily. Thank you. For doing <laughs> such a terrific job as my interlocutor. <laughs> Um, and uh, I hope we'll have the opportunity for further Facebook Live sessions. I do like to engage with Hamilton, the Hamilton community and the alumni more broadly. Um, and you know where to find me. I'm in Buttrick Hall, and I'm looking forward to more questions and more conversation. Great, and thank you for letting me be a part of this. Um, big thank you to you for being here and answering all of our questions. Um, and thank you to everyone watching tonight.